Hello students. In this video, we're going to talk about the phases of matter. And what I mean by the phases of matter is what state do we find matter in and why? So most of us are familiar with the terms gas, liquid, and solid. So what is the difference between gases, liquids, and solids, and why are they found the way they are? So the major difference between gases and the other two phases, the liquid and solid, which I'm referring to as condensed phases, is the distance between the particles. And we see in the gas phase that particles are extremely far apart and they're moving rather quickly. And that movement is related to kinetic energy because kinetic energy is the uh, energy that's associated with motion. And even in this picture, in most textbooks, they try to show that the gas particles have like these trails because they're moving quickly. The major difference between the condensed phases, the liquid and the solid, is what's referred to as freedom of motion. Now, it's hard to depict that in a 2D flat, non-moving image. But essentially, you can think of liquid particles even though they're very close to one another, they can kind of slip and slide on top of each other. That's why they have the ability to be poured or flow. And that ability is really referred to as what's called viscosity, the ability to flow. So we're going to talk about what the freedom of motion is and why it's different in liquids and solids. So freedom of motion, really you can think of it as a degree of motion. There's different types and there's varying degrees of this motion. So one of the common ones is translational freedom. That's the ability to move from one position to another. So you can think of it as, can this particle or molecule move from this point along the x-axis to this point? Now it doesn't have to be uh, just along a straight line in the x-axis. It could be a straight line at an angle or on the y-axis. But the key is with translational motion, it's moving in a straight line. Then there's what's called rotational freedom. And this is its ability to basically rotate in a direction in space. You can think of it as a molecule doing cartwheels. Does it have that ability to rotate in space? The last one is vibrational freedom. And this is the ability to kind of vibrate at one point in space. And this is primarily when we talk about solids having kinetic energy, because even though to the naked eye, solids don't have kinetic energy, they're not moving, they do have kinetic energy at a microscopic level because they can vibrate along a point. So we have to understand that vibrational energy is where particles are moving within a fixed point so they can move kind of back and forth. That's hard to understand because when we draw molecules, we think of like H2O, we, we draw the bonds of the two hydrogens bound to the oxygen, but those bonds are not fixed. But we have to understand those bonds are representing electron overlap, right? And electron overlap, remember, you know, electron orbitals are just probability maps of where we find these electrons. And those electrons are not static. They're constantly moving. So uh, almost a better representation of bonds would be springs like coils. And we can see that the molecule can vibrate or oscillate in a back to forth direction. They can come out of the plane. There's all these vibrational modes of freedom that solids can exhibit. So going back, how do we find something as a solid, liquid, or a gas? Well, that really depends on two major factors. One, the intermolecular forces. Intermolecular forces means it is the attractive force between molecules. The prefix inter, when you think of an international flight, that is a flight between countries. Intermolecular forces are the attractive forces between molecules, and then kinetic energy. So essentially, what's gonna decide if it's a solid, liquid, or gas phase is either the strength of the intermolecular force or the, the amount of kinetic energy. So you can think of it as a battle between these two. Kinetic energy, Ke, 
and intermolecular forces, IM attractions. And whichever one dominates is going to determine whether it's a solid, liquid, or a gas. The average kinetic energy of a sample, we have to remember, is related to temperature. And that's, you know, thermal energy. We learn this in thermochemistry. So if I increase the temperature, right, if I add heat to a system, the molecules are going to move faster. And when they move faster, they're going to have more kinetic energy. If they have more kinetic energy, they're going to separate from one another. And that's essentially what we see with boiling. So gas, the kinetic energy of gas molecules is greater than their attractive force. In fact, when we learn the ideal gas law, we're assuming that there are no intermolecular forces, that the molecules or gas particles are not sticking together. They're just flying in all different directions. Now, liquid has kinetic energy, and that's why it could flow. Right, so when we talk about freedom of motion, it has that translational motion and that rotational motion. So its kinetic energy is greater than its intermolecular forces, but it has strong enough intermolecular forces where it has a fixed volume. Now solids have very little kinetic energy. Their kinetic energy is primarily the vibrational energy that we were talking about before. Okay, so its dominant force is the intermolecular forces, and that's why it stays in a fixed position, because it's sticking together strongly. So let's talk about the properties of solids. They have high densities, okay? So solids usually are the most dense. That's why they're closely packed, the particles. And if you take like a coin, it'll sink in water because it's more dense than water. Now. One unique compound is liquid water. When it freezes, actually becomes less dense. So ice is less dense than liquid water, and that's why it floats. That has to do with the open lattice structure of the water molecule and based on the hydrogen bonding. So there's open pockets, but water is the exception. And it's a good exception that ice freezes on top because, you know, when we think of marine life, the liquid underneath can still sustain all aquatic life beneath it. But water is special. Water is special that the solid is actually less dense than the liquid. All other compounds, the solids are more dense than the liquids, and they're definitely more dense than the gases that are spaced far apart. Solids have a definite shape and they have a definite volume. So their volume and shape doesn't be, it doesn't change. You can't compress the solid anymore because the particles are already fixed in a certain location and surrounding particles are so close. Now there's two types of solids. There's crystalline and amorphous. The key is the crystalline solid is ordered. That means it has a re regular repeating pattern. And an amorphous solid is one that has an irregular pattern. So your two classic examples. When you think of crystalline solids, I tell students, think of salts. You know, most solids that we deal with in general chemistry are salts. We deal with uh, the crystal lattice structure, okay? Or you can think of covalent networks like in diamonds, but there's a fixed pattern. The amorphous solids, because of their irregular pattern, there's a little more flexibility, but they're still a solid. So you can think of plastic bottles. You can think of glass. Uh, if you go to the old churches, uh, the window panes, the stained glass over time begins to get thicker in the bottom of the window pane than the top because they're slowly flowing. Uh, another example is rubber. You take a rubber band, you can stretch it. So what about the properties of liquids? Well, again, they have high densities relative to gases. They have an indefinite shape. So what does that mean? they take on the shape of their container. And why is that? Because of the degrees of motion, the freedom of motion. Because they can move and slip and slide over each other, they don't have a fixed shape. But they do have a definite volume. And they have a definite volume because they have that strong intermolecular force that keeps them with a fixed volume and they can't be compressed. What about gases? 
Well, they have extremely low densities. And that's why compared to the condensed phases, solids and liquids, their densities are measured in grams per liter versus grams per milliliter. You need a much larger volume of gas to get a significant amount of mass because the particles are spaced so far apart from one another. They have an indefinite shape. They can fill up their container, whatever size it is. And they have an indefinite volume. And what does that mean? Well, just as they can expand and fill up, they can also be, with applied pressure, squeezed and compressed to fit into a smaller uh, container. So an example is you can think of a helium tank is really small, but when I release the pressure valve, I can fill up uh, balloons, helium balloons, to much larger volumes because they don't have that pressure and they can expand. So that's what this compressibility uh, slide shows you is with applied pressure, right? Gases can be squeezed closer and closer and closer, right? But if I have uh, liquids and solids, I can't do that because they're already really close. But with this gas, I see that there's a lot of empty space. So if I apply pressure, I can compress it. And now I have a uh, indefinite shape an indefinite volume because there's a lot of space. Again, I don't see that with liquids. So gases are highly compressible. So I hope this video makes sense because now we'll be moving on from talking about solid liquid gas to phase changes. We'll be doing calculations for phase changes. And we all know that if I have a solid, if I heat it up and apply heat, it is going to melt and it's gonna form a liquid. If I keep applying heat to that liquid, right, it's eventually going to boil and become a gas. So we're going to do those calculations, and we're going to understand that by applying energy to this, we're actually separating these molecules from one another, and we're creating a potential energy difference. So the energy of heat is being used to actually overcome the intermolecular forces and create greater distances between these molecules. Now, if I go in the reverse direction, right, it's gonna be a similar amount of energy for the same amount of substance, but instead of boiling, we might call this condensing, right, or condensation. And then from a liquid to a solid, we would call that freezing. And going in this direction, because we're applying heat, this would be considered an endothermic process. Why is it endothermic? Because the heat that we're adding is positive. Going in the reverse direction is considered exothermic. And this is what confuses students. Why is this exothermic? Why am I losing heat? Well, as these molecules approach one another, right, they're getting to a lower potential energy because the electrons and the positive nuclei are getting closer and that's what they want. So it lowers the potential energy and they release the excess energy in the form of heat to the surroundings. So, I hope this video helps in understanding the different phases of matter. And as we move forward, we'll learn about the intermolecular forces that keep these structures together and the calculations for them. Thanks for tuning in.